Good morning, everybody, and welcome to CBI at 10. Welcome back, I should say, back to school, new term. We've been away for a couple of months. Um, my name is Liz Mercy. I'm an editor and partner at Tortoise, so we work with the CBI to put together these sessions. Um, and we have a big topic that has really sort of gathered pace, if you like, over the um, summer break to talk about this morning. Um, but before we get in, we're going to talk about labour shortages and the labour market in general. Um, but before we get to the meat and potatoes of the conversation this morning, I'm going to come first to Matthew Fell, who, of course, is Chief UK Policy um, Director at the CBI. Good morning, Matthew. Nice to see you. Nice to see you in the office. Hi, Liz, and good morning, everyone. Look, I hope everyone managed to get a little bit of a break over the summer and uh, had a had a bit of a rest. We've got a busy autumn ahead of ourselves. Um, I think, Liz, look, I think on people's minds, obviously, uh, we've uh, got easing of restrictions on COVID. We're sort of trying and striving to get back to normal as much as possible. So one of the thoughts on that, I think, is just we're entering this phase where we've got to be living with the virus, uh, essentially. And I just wanted to say uh, CBI had set up some principles around this, you know, just making sure we're using mass testing to prevent hopefully mass isolation, making sure we utilize all the COVID secure tools available to just build up their both employee and consumer and customer confidence. And then thirdly, I think for the UK, look, we've got a world leading vaccine program. Let's completely sort of make the most of that sort of thing and be confident in doing so. So we've got a set of principles about living with the virus. And, and then, as you say, look, I'm back in the office. I think quite a few on the call are on the office as well. Uh, I suspect this is a bit of a back to term week feel for most people. Uh, and for most firms, particularly those who are office based and in sort of professional services and so on, I suspect this is their first week of really trying out properly their formal hybrid working arrangements and things like that as we enter this new phase. Um, I think there were some reports over the last 48 hours, quite a few cities are busier. I know in London, TfL reported that Monday was the busiest day on the tube for about 18 months. Plenty of other cities, Birmingham, Nottingham, Liverpool, I think traffic levels were on a par with sort of 2019 levels. Interestingly, I think that's not uniform right across the country. So people are playing it a little bit different uh, in some parts of the parts of the country and so on. Uh, but I think given we're now getting back into this, a bit of a reminder, look, uh, remote working has been brilliantly successful in many, many ways. So we want to hang on to some of the benefits of that. But also, I think some of those things that we've missed from the office, the upsides around collaboration, building team cultures, on the job trading and development and things like that. I think we're all keen to get back to a little bit of that as well. So I think there are things that we can do to make that a bit of a success, really. Firstly, you know, the government just implementing those living with the virus measures and principles that we talked about. I think for all the businesses on the call, uh, thinking about how you do really brilliant staff engagement, being clear there's no sort of one size fits all approach to getting this right, uh, being flexible oh, where you seems can. Seems like Matthew frozen. Uh, where uh, giving people confidence to travel and so on and things like that. And the big question I'm sure everyone's grappling with is what's the right sort of organization, team level, individual hierarchy that we work out these profession uh, preferences with and so on. So that's for business. And then just for individuals, as all of us as uh, employees, I guess, sort of thing, thinking about just making sure that we engage and give good feedback as well. Everyone's trying out new things here. So let's make sure we're learning and adapting as we go and have a bit of that spirit of give and take with the flexibility so that we make sure uh, we enter into it and learn as we go and adapt as we go to get it right. So those are the things that are on our mind, Liz, particularly on the sort of COVID front, I think. Thanks very much, Matthew. I mean, it's the same at Tortoise. We were an open newsroom. We've started our public in-person member events. So we've got to sort of manage people coming in and out, lateral flow testing, checking in and out. All of that is new for us. So um, certainly one to watch, and I'm sure we'll come back and talk about it again. Um, but this morning, we want to come and talk about a very sort of sh what a sharp edge. You know, we're at the sharp end of a, of a problem with labour and with skills and with supply chains and all of that. So just give us a bit of a set the scene a little bit for what we're going to get into it uh, shortly with Andrew and Gail. Yeah, completely. Look, I mean, who would have thought over sort of tw six, 12 months ago, the sort of biggest question on our mind would actually be labour shortages as we sort of went yeah. through the pandemic. But look, here we are. And it really is upon us. And I think the first thing I wanted to say, Liz, is this is this is just hitting lots of businesses where the shortages are hurting. You know, it's not uh, firstly, it's not just a sort of isolated case in one or two sectors and things like that. 
And also, I think uh, the bit where we differ from government a bit is I think their view is slightly this is going to sort itself out in fairly short order. And our view, as people might have seen, is actually this is going to be closer to a sort of two year rather than a two month endeavor without some serious intervention and targeted action right now. Look, uh, of course, I think the end of furlough will help uh, a little bit. But I suspect most of the firms that have still got people on furlough, those people, they're paying a contribution towards that. They're, they're probably thinking they want those employees and they're going to come back uh, to the business. And even for those that don't, uh, it's probably a little bit optimistic to think there's going to be a perfect skills match up straight away. So we think furlough might help at the margins, but it's not going to be a panacea. Uh, and of course, uh, things like training uh, are obviously the right answer. Uh, in the long run, but these things take time. You know, the view from the industry, HGV drivers and the shortage of those is right in the news. Uh, I think the industry estimates is going to take something like 18 months to train enough drivers to get through the sort of current shortages and things like that. So first message is uh, lots of business is hurting and this is going to take time without action. Uh, I think secondly, just to illustrate this point that it's biting right across the economy and at multiple skill levels as too. Look, as I said, the HGV drivers point is really well publicized, but because of that, clearly, it hits supply chains just about in every industry. So that's impacting right across the economy. And then we're hearing, look, shortages of chefs, of welders, of carpenters. It's so many different skill areas. And the individual stories uh, are really quite frustrating, actually. So we've spoken to hotel owners who are actually artificially limiting occupancy rates because they can't get things like the linen laundered quickly enough. We're talking to restaurants who are having to choose between opening at lunchtime or evenings because they can't manage to get sort of staff both of them sort of thing. So just at the moment when the economy is sort of lifting off and we're all poised for recovery, these are really, really frustrating if it's putting the brake on them. So that's the impact. Uh, and then finally, from me, just to set the scene, uh, of course, there's a heap of things that businesses can be doing here, investing in training, uh, some industries will take advantage of automation, digitization, and so on. Uh, increasing diversity, really important to maximize your appeal to as many of the population as you possibly can, obviously. Those are things within businesses' gift uh, to adapt to. But also a couple of things from government we think are really important. Uh, one is just making training that much easier. And in particular, we think there's a, an intervention around flexing the apprenticeship levy that so many firms pay. At the moment, they've got funds that they can't necessarily deploy. And if there was a bit more agility and flexibility in that so they can target that funding at the skill shortages they need right now and address those, we think that would be really helpful. And also, uh, using the powers that we now have uh, over our own immigration system, let's have a little bit more flex and agility in that too. So add the drivers and the other skills we need to the shortage occupation list. The whole idea of that is it should be complementary to the skills and training that we do in the UK, but it's adaptive and agile to the skills that we need as demand fluctuates in the economy. So that's the message from us. I think it's, a, it's going to be a longer term issue without action. It's biting right across the economy. And we've set out some things that we think the government could do right now to help in the short term. Matthew, what, what do you think? The, why is the government reluctant, particularly on that third point, the flex in the immigration system that has sort of been a hard won battle and now they seem reluctant to use that flex to, to as you say, this is a two year, not a two month problem. So it's not something that you know it needs patching and it needs patching now. Otherwise, we're really going to struggle to get back. What's that reluctance for? Yeah, look, I mean, uh, there's probably a myriad of reasons behind that. But actually, I think that the core of this uh, goes to the belief about, um, I, I think the prevailing view in parts of government is uh, this is a relatively short term issue that is going to sort itself out with as furlough unwinds and so on. And our contention is uh, it's quite deep seated. You know, we actually we had some of these shortages even before the pandemic. <laughs> so, uh, so it's not surprising they're still around when the economy takes off sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but also the fact that this is really widespread and entrenched across the economy rather than just in one or two sectors and things like that. I think those are that's the sort of the differing points of view uh, and probably could be a contributory factor behind uh, a lack of action so far. So I think those are the those are the arguments and the case we need to put forward and uh, and win those points. 
Thanks very much, Matthew. I'm going to come now to um, our first um, invited speaker this morning, Andrew Brody, who's People and Comms Director for um, Avara Foods. Um, Andrew, I, I really want to get into this. We've heard a lot about Nando's. We've all been very worried about KFC. But <laughs> tell us a bit about what your organisation is and what it does. Just give us a sense of the scale of, of it first. Sure. So, um, yeah, and we're very much at the centre of it. Um, Avara, one of the uh, main poultry suppliers in the UK, so we supply about a quarter of the UK's uh, fresh supply of, of poultry into retail and food service. Um, and uh, that's done through a, an end-to-end -end supply chain, so agriculture through to the, the retailer or food service, nine manufacturing sites and a significant agriculture base. So, um, and through that, in the UK, we employ um, just over 7,000 people. Um, so the long and short of it is we ought to employ just over 7,000 people, uh, but we currently have 800 vacancies. So uh, wow. as you can imagine, as, as People and Communications Director, this is rather, rather front and centre for me at the moment. Um, that's clearly impacting on our operational capabilities to, to process the agricultural supply chain through our factories uh, and get that to the, the customer. And clearly there were some headlines recently that uh, uh, including uh, a couple of our, our customers that reflected that. Um, we're seeing real pinch points in key skills in our primary processing factories, in butchery, in dispatch, and also with, with um, the uplifts that we need for um, seasonal barbecue uh, and other seasonal lines in summer. And, and now we, uh, we're one of the two main suppliers of turkey into Christmas. Um, that, that's, that's the challenge coming up next, uh, which is also starting to be uh, reported in the media across many different uh, uh, sectors. So, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a very challenging time. And I guess because we're a fresh food supply chain, we're pretty much at the sharp end of that. So we're a bit of the canary in the mine. We're impacted first because of the nature of our operation and our process. Andrew, when did you, so you've outlined compellingly 800 vacancies across a full staff of 7,000 and it's across lots of parts of your business, not all concentrated in one part of it. When did you start seeing that gap open up in terms of your ability to fill the vacancies that you need? And what do you think is the principal driver, so the principal drivers of the situation? Um, it, it really, <laughs> I think picking up on point Matthew made, it, it's the speed of this that I think has caught us by surprise. Right. So we um, we we were still absolutely fine February March. Um, uh, around Easter time, a few factors started to happen. One, um, a trend of um, um, uh, European colleagues in our business returning home that we've been watching since last autumn um, was continuing and was increasing. Um, and we were finding it increasingly difficult to replace those, both because of the restrictions of people coming into the country, but also because of the lack of available labour in, in, in the local communities to, to replace that, combined with a seasonal uplift that, that made the problem uh, worse as we moved into the, the, the summer season. So uh, it snowballed um, uh, very rapidly. Um, really, it wasn't clear for a few months what what we were looking at. Was it COVID? Was it pandemic? Um, what was it furlough? There were a number of short-term, clearly short-term factors that you could look at. But I guess what we've seen is as the dust has cleared, um, what we're looking at, and absolutely agree with what Matthew said and Tony Dank said yesterday, this is a, a long-term structural change in the labour market. People are leaving the UK labour market and you know, we can debate the reasons behind that, but they are leaving um, and they're not coming in. The labour pool is therefore shrinking. It's becoming uh, more home based, more British. And therefore, that's going to pose different challenges for us going forward. But it's posing current challenges because um, we have a lot of vacancies, but the UK economy has a lot of vacancies that it's that it's just not able to fill. And some of that structural issue is the fact that um, where the um, where the unemployment actually does reside is not necessarily where the vacancies are, and it takes a fair bit of time to work that through. I mean, in our business, we have some big operations in. Pardon? 
Ge geographically that where the unemployment yeah. is and where the labour could be, they don't live near each other. A absolutely. And, and clearly one of the particular challenges for our business is by definition, we have big operations in rural settings, um, yeah. which really can't move. Um, so we can't just pick it up and put it somewhere else because there's all the farms. So yeah. it's not just as simple as we'll move where the unemployment is. Um, so that's what I mean about there's no short term quick fixes and there is a long term structural uh, change that, that we need to get our heads around. Andrew, um, what can you do about it? You're sitting there. I mean, people and comms is, a, is an interesting combination. You don't often find people and comms stick together in, in one job. You've obviously got a sort of immediate term issue and Christmas is coming at us and everybody wants a turkey dinner and then you've got a sort of long-term as you say structural issue Matthew mentioned a couple of things you know diversity is part of it training is part of it that are within businesses gift um like you say you can't lift East Anglia and put it somewhere down somewhere different where the people are it what are the things that you can do yourself uh, to, to, to sort of help to alleviate the problem yeah so I mean, back in the summer, in the very short term, um, like a lot of businesses, we tried attraction bonuses, we tried re retention bonuses, we put on more transport, and by by early August, it was apparent that that wasn't working at all. Um, so, I mean, literally, um, as in this period, a few weeks ago, um, we have moved our pace significantly um, to compete and to attract people because it's pure supply and demand. If the demand exceeds the supply, then, then, then you have to compete for the available labor. So we felt that we had no choice but to significantly move our pay and particularly within that to move some of those uh, skilled pay rates, increase the gaps to those uh, to encourage movement through skills. Um, and that, that step has been taken. Um, uh, before we got into the the, the autumn season. Um, in terms of what's in front of us, um, yes, we're looking now at um, our, our, at our operational uh, footprint, at how we can use it best to, to look at where we do have labour supply and moving more production to where we can access labour, um, particularly um, in, the, in the West Midlands, we've got some big facilities um, because we're very constrained, for example, we're not in East Anglia, but we are in Herefordshire, same kind of issues and, and therefore yeah. same kind of, uh, of, of challenges. Um, so that's that's kind of where we are. In the longer term, I, I agree with Matthew, the answer is automation, the answer is investment in technology and, and higher skills, um, but clearly um, that's something that takes a, a long time. We have been doing it, we are doing it, we will be doing it. Um, but it takes a long time. The current circumstances aren't helping us move that forward. Um, and that's really going to be the, the challenge for us. We, we know what we need to do. We actually have a business plan to deliver it. Uh, but right now, um, we're, we're constrained by the circumstances of the current market. That sort of investment as well, that kind of growth investment and the, the innovation and all of that stuff that we were talking about if you've just had to effectively increase you've rebased your people cost budget at a higher level just to get through those sorts of plans start to look more difficult to implement because you're talking about an entirely different economic situation what do you need from government to, to to help you be able to you know stay on the path that you wanted to be on um i i think i'm and and this is this is going to echo some of the things matthew said i mean the government have been really clear we're going to we want a higher skill um a higher tech economy um we get that that's what we want as well we have an investment plan to deliver that um but it takes time we can't flick a switch so mm -hmm. in the short term we need the government to not change tack on their policies but simply to um, allow us to utilize tools they've already put in place so there is a skills derogation um, program for, for key skills to bring into the country. Um, we'd like butchers and primary workers in, in our operations on it. Um, there is a seasonal scheme for horticulture. We'd like the meat sector to be in it. So these are existing schemes. In the, in following on from that, skills development um, 
uh, I'd echo um, what Matthew said about the apprentice levy and, and also that Tesco's came out on that yesterday. Absolutely agree with that. And food is underrepresented in the lifetime skills list at the moment. It's been very hard to get them on there uh, and we need, we need more there. I think longer term, what I think our ask of government would be, um, we share revision, um, you need to help us get there. So Rishi's tax breaks uh, in the budget, great start. Um, but I think we're going to need some um, uh, basically government backed loans to help us accelerate the automation that we need to get to the to get to the new world and, and to create a, that that modern food supply chain. Yeah. Um, really interesting. Uh, just before I come to Gail, who's very patiently um, waiting to come in to talk about um, the labour market more generally, you you, you sort of mentioned um, and very honest about the fact that this sort of came upon you very quickly. It sort of accelerated quickly from a number of smaller impacts and then suddenly you were really hit. I sort of almost wonder whether there are other businesses, other sectors who haven't been hit yet, but maybe it's going to come upon them too. What advice would you give from the journey that you've been on, the things that you've done? What, what do you think people might do to, just to sort of get a sense of preparedness if this starts to happen elsewhere? Um. I think the short answer would be, um, it, do, don't think this is going to be over by Christmas. This is not going to be over by Christmas. And if, if you think it is, then you're going to be in big trouble. Um, I think also, if you're on this call and you're um, at the higher skill, higher pay end, and you think this isn't going to impact on you, I, I don't think that's true either. I think it will wash through. Um, and certainly, and this is certainly driving our thinking at the moment, if you think that what you've done for the last five years is going to get you through the next five years, you're in really big trouble. Um, right. My best advice would be, and it picks up on, on, on a point already uh, made on, on diversity and inclusion, um, is um, look at where you're operating, look at the employment market and ask yourselves, are you appealing to all parts of that community? And if not, what do you need to do to do so because you're going to have to work harder at it and fundamentally if the labor really isn't there um you're going to have to move over uh, time to where it is the, the one yeah. one of these structural changes is clearly with the the eu workforce they were prepared to travel a long way to to work really the evidence the last 30 years would suggest that if there's unemployment in the uk and you wait for it to come to you you're going to be sat there a long time so we're going to have to be more flexible and agile in, in where we operate um, to, to move to where the, the labour supply is, because there clearly is genuine unemployment. Um, yeah. But is it where you're operating? And if it isn't, then what are you going to do about that? Yeah, brilliant. Thank you ever so much, Andrew. I just want to um, note for the um, benefit of the people on the call, some comments um, relating to what Andrew's been talking about from Anthony Goodger, who's put in um, that he totally agrees. I'm sorry, Anthony, I can't see the, the organisation you're from on my screen. Totally agree. The seasonal agriculture workers scheme needs to be extended to seasonal poultry workers, um, that uh, in his organisation, they've been lobbying for food skills to be included on lifetime skills, including butchery and also talking about the introduction of a dedicated tea level for food manufacturing and processing um, because at the moment that's sort of absorbed into a broader um, tea level but not a dedicated qualification of its own so three really interesting and, and, and pertinent suggestions there too specifically on food um, i'm going to come to gail now thanks so much for waiting gail and um, gail blake your head of permanent appointments at hayes obviously a, a huge um organization that knows all about the ins and outs of the labor market not just food um mm -hmm. just tell us in a, a couple of sentences idiots kind of a, a little bit about Hayes and about what you do there so Hayes is the biggest specialist recruiter in the UK and I look after all permanent appointments and um, so that's across all sectors um anything from IT education finance construction and property office support most sectors we would cover so um, I was listening intensely to everything Andrew was saying and you probably saw me nodding away a lot and I can assure you Andrew actually it's everyone that's feeling the same way every sector that we deal with we have shortages in it's so yeah I, I was I, I found him very eloquent and I completely agreed with everything he was saying so Gail you've got sector uh, cross sector shortages and yes. se seniority shortages too that sort of horizontally and vertically we can't fill the roles 
Absolutely. So, so whether you're looking at a qualified accountant or a labourer on site, we are struggling to find people at the moment. There is no sector that we have at the moment that I could say we have a surplus of candidates in. Gail, what's your best assessment as to why that is? And was it the same situation for Hayes as Andrew experienced where it's all, it sort of became a problem quite quickly? I would actually, I would say uh, yes and no, sorry. In comparison to the global financial crisis, it took us 14 months really to come out of it. So I think for most organizations, they probably felt it, but they had time to readjust and get ready. Where I feel sorry for organizations is that they, it's felt like they've had to pivot incredibly quickly. So what we took around 14 months to do last time, we've probably taken 14 weeks to do this time. So if you look at that recovery, it bounced back really quickly. And so you're pivoting from organizations being in the driving seat because this time last year, they were in the driving seat when it came to recruitment. They could really they had a lot of choice and they could pay really what they wanted to now being at quite a disadvantage. So if you actually look at the way that curve has come back, not only have we come back to pre-COVID levels, we're ahead of where we were. In fact, the REC and KPMG have assessed how many, how many vacancies there are, and it's actually at 953,000 unfilled roles. You're looking at it being higher than pre-COVID. In fact, it's the highest the REC has seen in 28 years of doing the survey. So I'm 22 years in recruitment and I have never seen it this busy. So I think if you're feeling like it's intense, as from anyone who's any organisations are looking to recruit, it's because it is intense. So, so, um, so on, on the one hand, it's come back faster, a lot faster than it did with, with the, the GFC. However, we saw it after Christmas. So as soon as we came back after Christmas, we started to see a real pickup. And, and if I'm being really honest, we looked at it. The first week and thought, well, is this, this is unusual? Is it just is it just a one off? And then it happened the week after, and it happened the week after, and it happened the week after. So I think that was organisations feeling more confident as the vaccine roll rollout came out. So if, as ever, you have the early adopters who straight away start recruiting, and then you have people who start to follow. And obviously, there are organisations. Andrew was describing where it's seasonal, so of course they're not going to recruit until they need people. But actually, we started to see it in January. And Gail. I'm really interested in this. Uh, it, I don't think it was a CBI event, but it was a, a, another one that I was moderating where we were talking about um, retention. Of, everybody's obsessed yes. with making hybrid work. Everybody's obsessed with the new normal, all of that stuff. We've talked about it yeah. endlessly. As Matthew rightly observed, this week it's happening for every, everyone. Yes. <laughs> you know, we're, the, we're the last lot, I suppose, to really try, sort of test out the theories. Um, but there was some speculation um, maybe sort of June time, that there would be a, a, a sudden influx of people looking for work because they would have made a call and said, I'm going to go and look for a new job. I'm ready for a change. I've got myself through my 18 months of lockdown, whatever. Has, is that something you've seen as well? Is there a sort of, there's a demand side bit in terms of, you know, people looking for work as well as the vacancies? Um, the, the reason, I think the way it's going at the moment is, yes, there are people moving jobs, but it's very much you have to go and find them as opposed to them coming right. to you. So we're not seeing in any of the. Oh, the suddenly we can't we have. So we look at, for example, how many applications do we have per role? And actually it's diminishing. Oh, that's okay. really strange. Yeah, you know, I don't still can't hear me. You no, you, you went briefly, but I can hear very you again old. now. You still can't hear me? You can hear me, yeah. Um, so um, I think, sorry, I think just recapping on the question, you were, you were asking me um, just in terms of, the, 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 well, there are lots of people looking for work, I think was what you were asking me yeah. before, but obviously something yeah. happened with my sound. But, but in, in terms of lots of people looking for work, I would say no, in terms of the traffic that we're getting, and obviously with the biggest specialist recruiter, we the traffic we're getting, it's we're having to go and find them as opposed to them coming to us. It's exactly what Andrew was saying, actually. He was saying, I was writing it down earlier, he was saying you had attraction bonuses and you were, trying all these things that would normally work and it's you've got to go and find them so unfortunately i wish i could say we've had this this influx what i would say is is that definitely they're more confident now that the applicants they're more confident now than they have in a long time to move a year ago they didn't want to move because they were worried understandably about the economy so the good news is all the consumer indexes support that actually candidates applicants if you approach them and offer them the right thing would be more willing than they have been in the last 12 months listening to you 
But as Andrew said, it's very much you have to go and find them as to as opposed to them coming to you. And I think there'd be lots of people who would agree with what Andrew was saying earlier. And Gail, two parts to that then as a follow up thought. Um, there's the organisation that needs to go and find the candidates rather than the other way around. Yes. How best do they do that? And secondly, you said if you if you go and find the candidate and you offer them the right thing, they'll listen to you. What is the right thing? So first of all, where do I go? And secondly, what's the right thing? So, so where do you go? I think ultimately it's about, I think first of all, it matters what you're going to say to them and then it's how do you go to them. I think yeah. what you need to say, what you need to think about is, is it's got to be about them and about their career as opposed to, you. and it sounds strange, but the issue you have, of course you have an issue, you need to build these roles, but you've got to make it about them because to be honest, most of the people that you're looking for have already got a job. They are already in work. So straight away, it's about really making it about them. What is missing from their current roles? And how could your organization help them to meet that? So as opposed to in a way, it is no longer you just interviewing them, it's also about them interviewing you and about really getting under the skin of what is missing, what would tempt you to leave. So I think it's about the way that you approach it. You know, how would you score your job out of 10 at the moment? What would make it a 10? What is missing? How could we possibly help you with that? So I'd make it very centric around the person that you're looking to attract. You ask where you go. So first of all, the message is important. I think then you said, where should I go? Uh, and, and I think ultimately that's where, whether it's Hayes or any recruiter, I think going to recruit that can, has a, a database of candidates that then you can proactively go and speak to them about. But I think you've got to be clear. First of all, put them first. That's really important. The first, second thing I would say is what is your employee brand, brand value? What is your proposition? What is it that you are trying to put out there? There's a lot of people competing for talent. So what's really important is what is different about you? I think all of us who work for different organisations, we all know why we're different to similar people in the same sector as us. But do you really communicate that well? Do you really articulate that well when you go to look for talent? So I think it's really important if you haven't really done it. It sounded like actually listening to Andrew that they've really looked at themselves and they've really thought about how can we stand out? And you'd obviously looked at lots of different approaches, not just one which I thought was excellent. And, and, at, and at one point you reassessed uh, pay, but you'd also looked at other things as well. And that's what I would say is you need to look at your brand proposition, make sure you're not underpaying because that won't work. But also, what are the other things you can offer? It was really interesting, actually. I was in one of our, I was in our Maidstone office yesterday, and one of my colleagues said to me, actually, if you don't offer hybrid working in a sector, now it's very sector led, some, some you know, construction, it's very difficult to offer it. But if you're in a sector where most of your competitors are offering hybrid working and you're not, you're going to be at such a, such a disadvantage. So I think it's not just about money, it's about everything that you can offer. Um, I also think it was really interesting that we were talking about diversity and how we can include more people in the workplace. What I think is fantastic about what's happening in the labour market now is more women are in work than ever before, have come out of being what we class as inactive to being in the labour market. So it's, it's great news from a diversity point of view, but I think hybrid working can also help not just get a better gender balance, but also differently abled people are able to participate more in the labour market. It's been proved because of the ability to, to, work hybrid, to have hybrid working or balanced working. So I think um, as both Matthew talked about and also Andrew talked about, given that I agree, by the way, with both of them, I don't think this is a short term. I think it's a more longer term issue. We have got to widen that pool as to who do we consider and how do we get to them? But I think be very clear as to what is your employee value proposition. And then secondly, how are you going to get it out there? How are you going to do that and make sure that whoever's representing you is able to, to, to point out how you're different? But fundamentally, it's about the person. What is, what's it going to take them to leave? That's, that's really important. It's fascinating, Gail. It really is. Andrew, if you think about Avara, Foods. Is is that sort of employee value proposition? Is that a phrase that you use and think about? Is that has that been sort of an active thing that you that you is is a, a you know prescient in your organisation? Can we hear Andrew? Okay, I'm on yes, me. Um, uh, yes, absolutely. I, I agree with Gail. You've got to 
you've got to look at how you appeal to your to your local uh, labour market, and and particularly what we've been trying to focus on is how we particularly appeal to um, uh, younger workers, particularly under 25s. Um, they are the, the the group most impacted by COVID, and and really looking to build a uh, a reward and skills proposition for for those groups um, that that appeals. Um, equally uh, looking at um, uh, how we appeal when we talk about all parts of the community. Um, as a sector, we, we, ha uh, we are underrepresented compared to the wider um, uh, society uh, uh, from an employment point of view in terms of women. So we need to do more to appeal um, uh, to, to, to women, given that traditionally um, we've been seen as more of a male dominated sector. So yeah very very much looking to try and perhaps change the perceptions of the sector which is probably that it's quite manual quite um male dominated and actually people come around and they go wow it's really there's automated and there's loads of robots and technology that they didn't expect to see so there's a perception for us that we have to get across that it's that that actually it's a lot more advanced than than people think yeah, it's really fascinating. I wonder how, um, I mean, Avara is obviously a, a, a large company. I wonder how small and medium sized organisations kind of cope in this fight for talent where you don't have the sort of, I'm sure your job isn't doesn't always feel luxurious, Andrew, but you don't have the luxury, you know, of an Andrew who, who spends all of his days sort of thinking about communications and people and how to position the organisation. If you've got, you know, somebody who's running, you know, marketing, finance, production front of house you know how do those organizations they they can't have an employee proposition can they those organizations scale is she frozen or is she just oh, still okay. oh no she's <laughs> yeah um well i would go back to saying that that actually make make your value proposition then about the people you want to employ and ask them what it is that they're looking for that's what i would do so i think if you make it very centric to the people that you want and ask them what is missing and i actually think what's great about working for small and medium-sized organizations is there's an awful lot of flexibility you can flex very quickly and, and move your your pay scales your hybrid working whatever other benefits that you want to offer actually in some ways you've got an awful lot of flexibility so you you know if you can then pick up on what is it you know what where is your talent and what what normally are they looking for to move roles i actually think you can be quite an advantage because you can just flex and and really pivot very quickly to match what it is that your target candidate is looking for and i think ultimately if you show interest in someone's career and you show and you listen to what it is that they're looking for you don't have to be a big organization to do that it's just making it very clear that you're very interested in what are that, their values, their interests, their motivations, getting to know them as a person. Actually, in some ways, small and medium-sized practices have actually an advantage because they can, yeah. they can speed up that recruitment process. That's one of the other tips that I would give to anyone listening to this that's asking, you know, how on earth do I get staff in now? My biggest piece of advice to, would be, be personal, be flexible. Um, I, you know, again, you need you need to go to them. And it was interesting that Andrew, you were talking about, you know, moving sort of geographical areas. Well, one of the things we advise our clients to do is go to them for an interview. You know, a lot of people are using things like Teams or Zoom or any platform to do an interview. But if you are somebody that likes to meet likes to meet people face to face, why don't you go to them and meet them for an interview in a Costa or wherever it might be? So I think. There are lots of things you can do to show that you're interested and going out of your way. Um, I also would say speed up that recruitment process. So whereas actually before you might have had two or three or four interviews, you know, cast a thousand interviewing somebody, I know of organisations now that are getting those three stages, as in the three people you'd normally meet, on one interview. Okay. Because what a lot of organisations are finding is they'll have someone on interview, first interview, and while they are then trying to arrange this, they like the candidate, they want to arrange the second interview, they've gone, they've gone between yeah. them because all of your competing and you know their organisation compete with you. Are, uh, so my advice would be really try and narrow down that selection process, get as many people on as possible, 
be open-minded, be flexible. Yeah. You may have wanted this, you might need to consider this instead. Um, write a list of what is essential and be really honest about what's essential in a candidate and what is just desirable, what would you like as opposed to, and I think really home in on the non-negotiables and stick with those, but try and be flexible where you can be, would be my advice. Really good advice. Thanks ever so much, um, Gail. It was completely fascinating. I feel like I've got a thousand more questions, but we have only got four more minutes, so I can't ask a thousand more questions. And I know Matthew wants to talk a little bit about um, what's coming up over the next uh, few weeks and months um, from a CBI perspective. So thank you very, very much, Gail, and thank you very much, Andrew. I sort of feel like I want to wish you good luck. It sounds like you're in the middle of a real maelstrom at the moment, and, I, and I'm sure it sort of feels uh, pertinent to people listening on the call as well um, but it's been packed with uh, um, brilliant insight and some really good advice as well so I'm very grateful for that and um, Matthew you wanted to do a quick rat tat tat of things dates with people's diaries and what to look out for I think yeah Liz thank you but just uh, before I get to that just to echo what you said a load of great advice from an insight from Andrew and Gail and I think the three or four points that I jotted down is that one I think this point about employee value proposition is just super important, both for uh, organizations, individual roles, for sectors in their entirety, everything that Andrew and Gail have talked about, whether it's, you know, you need to double down on your efforts to increase diversity. If you've not properly embraced flexible working, then you absolutely can, and that can increase the talent pool and so on. Uh, are you appealing to people and tackling some of the perceptions about sectors and industries that maybe don't exist anymore, but people still feel are a barrier to them? That is sort of one big area, I think, to get into. Uh, second, we've not talked about loads today, but I'm really interested as well. There's lots of innovation and almost sort of entre entrepreneurial spirit going on to sort of cut through some of this. And I know in industries like hospitality, for example, the sort of booming apps where you're able to map students to some of the uh, work that's required at relatively short notice. Look, that's not a model that's going to be right and work for everybody, but it might for some as well. So that idea of using innovation to cut through some of the challenges is really interesting. Uh, and then I think the point about uh, training, we heard from where Wink Canton and others have been in the news about thinking, can we actually shrink the time that it takes to train people into certain roles without in any way hitting the rigor and the quality of that training, but that agility about how we get people retrained and matched into roles, I think is really interesting to explore too. Uh, and then my final thought on this is just, Look, different companies are still in very different places as we come out of the pandemic and head into recovery. And for everyone who's able to sort of invest more in technology and training, there are many others who are still in really sort of quite difficult situations who've been sort of had ravaged balance sheets for the last 18 months. So I think we should just be mindful of that when we're thinking about the pace of recovery and how we lean into this as an issue. So those were some of my takeaways from today's uh, discussion, which was absolutely brilliant. Um, in terms of things coming up, people just to look out for in terms of CBI activity, three things to mention. Look, next Monday, uh, Tony is going to be uh, out big on investment. We're trying to sort of set the, the tone for that autumn debate around that, how we optimize uh, the environment for investment uh, in the UK. Uh, second, back on this topic, uh, in a couple of weeks time, we're commencing the 20th, we've got our transforming work week. So if people are really into this sort of reskilling debate, the labor squeeze, future of DNI, how's hybrid working going? Do tune into that series because we'll have loads more of these sort of practical insights uh, on offer. Uh, and then third for me would just be into, uh, into October. Uh, we've got a big national consultation going on around our sort of seize the moment themes on that long-term future of the UK economy. So if people want to get stuck into that as well, please do join us for there. We've got experts, we've got the CBI leads, uh, really keen to engage with people. So Liz, Brilliant today and just a few things to look out for in the coming weeks as we head into the autumn from the CBI. Thanks so much, Matthew. Um, as I always say, go put the kettle on before you go and check your emails. Have a great day, everyone. We'll see you again soon. Take care. Bye.